does not apply. Okay, so. Um, yeah, so the attendees have started joining. Just wait for two, three minutes. I think there are 75, 78, 82. Yes, let's wait for a couple of minutes. So. Uh, Rohit, uh, hmm. uh, Professor Subbu joined or no? How do you, I mean, if he's an attendee, can you make him panelist? Yeah, he's in. He just ah, texted okay. me he's in. Right. So, uh, madam, can you make him panelist? Uh, yes. Ah. I have. Ah. Okay. Okay. Hi, Professor Subranian. Hello. Hi. Hey, Rohit. Hey, everyone. Nice. Very nice to Hi. see you. Hi, Subhu. Hey. Thank you for joining us early morning. Oh, no worries. No worries. Ah, it looks like... I think I think it is a holiday also, right? Yeah, it's Black Friday, right, today? <laughs> After Thanksgiving holiday, yeah. Well, yeah, so you? Case, you supposedly you should be awake all night anyway. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. So, Subhu, by the way, I'm Ranjit Nanda. So, hello, Ranjit. Myself, Chaitanya. Hi, Chaitanya. So, maybe, uh, Subhu, I can uh, quickly. So, uh, um, like, we are seven of us. So, <laughs> Professor Ranjit is there. He is the head. Then, uh, Satyesh, um, Chaitanya, Suraj, uh, Tarak, and then uh, Professor Shantani is also there. So it's a mix of uh, people from chemistry department, physics department, chemical engineering, metallurgical and materials engineering. Okay, well, hello everyone. Thanks Rohit for actually inviting. Thanks everyone. Yeah, I we are happy that you can make it. Right. Uh, sure. Uh, I'm actually looking forward to hearing about the center. Okay. So, can we start? Uh, yes. So, I'll start with the video. Yeah. Yeah. Please. you can develop uh, superconductors that work at higher temperatures, then effectively you can have completely lossless power transmission. Stone, bronze, iron, and then steel, glass, aluminium, plastic, silicon, the list goes on. The evolution of humankind has been conjoined with our use of materials. For our civilizational growth, solving the real world problems, everywhere you need efficient materials. That's why Materials research is at the forefront. Center for Atomistic Modeling and Materials Design. We employ sophisticated many body theories and state-of-the-art computational techniques to study and predict properties of materials. With the aim of not only having predictable properties of materials, but also to create a material database. Whatever material we see in front of our eyes, all of it consists of atoms, electrons, protons. With the atomistic modeling, what we try to do is use some uh, physical equations to capture the interaction between the atoms. We allow them to evolve over time. So doing such computational experiments allows us to see how this physical equations which are between just two atoms, how they are resulting in the higher level property which manifests when you are talking about 10 raised to the power 23 atoms being together. That is to do with understanding the thermodynamic stability of materials, uh, their properties, processing structure property relationship using atomistic tool. We primarily work on four domains. These are quantum materials, energy materials, 
materials for sustainability and polymers. My research groups work on machine learning and molecular modeling of uh, materials, particularly polymer and soft material, and come up with design rules which can be useful to develop new polymer which are more sustainable and see how we can come up with new methods to recycle the polymer. The other things that we are dealing with are uh, energy materials. So there we do know that uh, there is lithium ion batteries in our mobile phones, in this camera, everywhere. We are trying to move towards the renewable energy resources there. These batteries are very much crucial, but lithium resources are pretty scarce in India. So we need to find alternate materials again that can be useful. My research group is working on the development of materials that have application in energy storage and catalysis. Mainly we are focusing on something called an interface engineering. We are also employing machine learning approaches to develop new materials for electrocatalytic applications. I work on quantum materials and energy materials. I explore fundamental quantum states. Also, I equally focus on applied uh, research. Quantum materials are those materials where even when you go to a macroscopic scale, you require the tools of or the machinery of quantum mechanics to understand that. Quantum mechanics and quantum materials would be materials for future applications. Let's say that you want to have power transmission without loss. If you can develop uh, superconductors that work at higher temperatures, then effectively you can have completely lossless power transmission. CAMMD is essentially a very unique mix of researchers, faculties, students. There are multiple people who are involved and there are multiple avenues in which they are already very good at. So definitely people with a complementary background who does uh, experimental research will find it a good fit to collaborate with us. So any industry any uh, academic person working on uh, solving some of the materials challenges, I think they would really benefit from collaborating with our center. At one place, you can get a very holistic information. So, well, please uh, come and collaborate with us. That ability to see materials as a set of atom can help you not only manipulate it, but you understand any material in general better. In computational material science, probably we can come close to the real situation while implementing the fundamental theories that are needed to predict properties. Therefore, we are natural partners for everyone. So. Yeah, with that, I think uh, we will get started. Uh, I am Satish Yadav, uh, faculty at Department of Metallurgical Materials Engineering here at IIT Madras. Am I audible, uh, Ranjit? You are audible, Satish. Okay, so uh, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, chair of today's webinar, uh, Professor Subramaniam K. R. S. Sankarnarayanan. He is Associate Professor at Department of Mechanical and Industrial Engineering at uh, University of Illinois in Chicago. He is also Group Leader of Theory and Modeling at Center for Nanoscience Materials, Argonne National Laboratory. He is representative of pioneering uh, computational material scientist of his generation and a world leader in computational science with a masterful grasp on material science, physics, computing, and machine learning. He has also appeared largely in molecular dynamics technique to understand macro, macro scale tribological phenomenon using uh, materials engineering at nano scale to, re to revolutionize the field of tribology. He's also combining first principles physics with machine learning for accelerating materials discovery. Welcome, uh, Professor Subramanian. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for the kind introduction, Satish. So with that, uh, 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 Ms. Dhanya, should I introduce uh, Dr. Ranjit Nanda? I mean, yes, Professor, I think we can start with the webinar. I just wanted to welcome everyone uh, to today's webinar. And we are focusing on 
the center of excellence in atomistic modeling and materials design as we just saw and today uh, we are really honored to have with us professor ranjit nanda um, principal investigator along with the entire team and also welcome to professor subramaniam shankaran and thank you so much for joining us sir so yeah without further ado i give up the uh, floor to the team to start today sir okay uh, with that uh, thanks danya uh, well quickly introduce uh, our, our uh, principal investigator uh, professor ranjit nanda he is professor at department of physics at indian institute of technology madras in chennai he develops the hamiltonian of interacting electron to provide theoretical insight into solid material he specializes in strongly correlated electron system and emerging quantum material particularly exploring non trivial topological quantum phases uh, along with that he also started he got interested in uh, various applied materials Yeah, I'll ask you, but that, uh, uh, Saranjit Okay, so, uh, I have shared the slide. Is it visible? Yes. Uh, not yet, Ranjit. Uh, Satis, uh, your okay. net is a little down, I guess. Uh, colleagues, is it? Yeah, visible? I cannot, but yeah, maybe it, it is visible. Is visible. It's visible. Yeah. You can put it on screen share. Please go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So, okay. Uh, I think there are some issues. Some participant has enrolled closed captioning. Uh, Ranjit, you can cancel that from your screen and get started. Uh, so first of all, uh, thank you all. Uh, thank uh, Professor Brahmanian for chairing this session. Uh, so what I'm going to do is that I'm going to give an overview of the center of excellence on atomistic modeling and metals design. Uh, after the overview, uh, so we'll invite questions and answers. People can write their questions and answers in the chat box and they can be read and answered by all the members of the team. Um, this is how the journey started. IIT Madras is now one of the many uh, institute of eminences. So IIT Madras under this institute of eminence uh, come up with the idea of developing center of excellences. The institute has been uh, prioritizing in several areas, as you can see on the screen, uh, starting from uh, medicine, biology, to quantum science, technology, to sensing, to complex system, to big database networks, and many more things. And in this scheme of thought, we, a group of seven uh, investigators, uh, have developed this, uh, established this center of excellence under the advanced material cluster. Uh, I myself, Ranjit Nanda, as Satyas has already introduced, I lead the team, uh, but so I'm just one among the all seven. Uh, I have uh, Santanu Mukherjee from physics. Uh, he works on quantum material by and large. Uh, I have Satish Yadav, uh, he works on several of stuffs. Uh, he works on high entropy alloys, he works on battery materials, he, he works on developing a database. Uh, my colleagues Yami Jala and uh, colleagues Suraj, they are from the Department of Chemistry. They work on energy material catalysis and many other stuff. Then I have my friend Tarak, he's from chemical engineering and focuses on AI and ML as well as, as far as the materials are concerned. He works on the polymers as sustainable materials. And we have Rohit Batra. He's a new member in the team, and he has exclusive expo expertise on AI and ML. So what we do in advanced material, why we have named it as atomistic modeling and materials design. Uh, 
for some reason, the slide is not moving. So this, in fact, we are not the only seven member who are uh, driving this center. The brains behind the center are our research scholar, postdoctoral fellows, technical staffs, and the scientists. Um, how do you look at it? Why such a center is important? I am just giving you two examples with which we all of us are very familiar. The top panel shows a case of a bullet train. Right? This train can go with a speed of 603 kilometers per hour. Then the technology behind making it so fast is the use of superconducting magnets. So superconductors are perfect dye magnet. They have a levitation properties as I have shown here. Then from where this levitation behavior, the perfect magnetic behavior comes, this perfect magnetic behavior comes due to the electronic structure that occurs at the atomic level, right? You can see that I think most of us have at, at least casually heard about the Cooper pairs. They're not the, uh, these are the pairs which club up two electrons, two single particles, and that pair gives such a dramatic uh, transport behavior, which is responsible for zero resistivity and responsible for creating a perfect diamagnet. There are many other new domain of uh, uh, superconducting theory are coming up, and my colleague Santan we can discuss a little more. So this is how the atomist level, atomistic level phenomena plays an important role in designing material. And by after designing those material, we can use them in real world applications. Another example, which is a buzzword nowadays, is electric vehicles. Most of the cars, which are electric vehicles, they write EV and a green color uh, plate, right? What does it mean? So it doesn't emit any CO2. In a sense, it's a green technology. But the EVs are not like come from the sky, right? So you have to develop batteries which store energy, and that energy used by your motor vehicle, right? This batteries. Again, there is a ionic level behavior uh, at the, uh, in the micro, microscopic or nanoscopic scale, how this ion behaves, right? How they diffuse, how they move. That kind of transport phenomena, again, you can only get by carrying out atomistic level simulation. So this, this two example must have enabled you to get the feeling that why atomistic level, uh, see, understanding the properties at the atomic level and carrying out simulation to design materials so that the world can, uh, we can have really wide range of real world applications and why they are important. Okay, so this is how our center is drawn out of that curiosity or that desire. So we solve the problem at the quantum level. So it is a typical, in general, we all believe when we say quantum mechanics, solving the score injury equation is size to be psi. This is one, one of the many quantum level theories are involved. We take several set of known materials, right? We solve the Schrodinger equation or try to develop an atomistic level simulation to understand the electron and ionic behavior using varieties of theories. Few of them are cited here, density functional theory, molecular dynamic simulation, and uh, then we have model Hamiltonians. And we use them to get information about the properties of the material, both electronic and ionic. Those properties of material, again, we can put them in our basket of machine learning. And that machine learning can augment our database and it can give us large number of new materials. And the cycle continues till we get an efficient uh, material for a desired applications. This is where the thrust of Center for Atomistic Modeling and Materials Design. So I'll go one by one, our focus areas. So quantum materials, all right? So quantum materials give rise to the future generation of quantum technology. It's quantum materials, uh, quantum technology in the sense quantum computation, memory, uh, storage devices, and many other aspects. These quantum materials come off the out of the very fundamental electronic behavior in the system. These fundamental electronic behavior are like coming out of unconventional superconductor, charge or spin order materials, strange metals, quantum remote insulator, topological insulators, and many more, right? So me and myself and Santanu, we spearhead the work uh, on the quantum materials. Here is a very simple uh, schematic explanation of 
So what a stochological insulator is, right? A stochological insulator in a broad sense is that it can be insulating inside, but on the edge, it's a conducting one. It has a protected conducting state. That protected conducting state is very crucial. Nowadays, several uh, applications have emerged out of the stochological insulator. And these are highly mobile. Their conductivity is very large and several aspects they give rise to. You can employ the standard uh, density functional theory model Hamiltonians and build, uh, find out which compounds are topological insulator. And there are large class of topological insulators are there, not only one, many topological phases are there. Then see here another snapshot of an unconventional uh, superconductor. Here what we have demonstrated is that experimentally you get a microscopic image and the same microscopic image you can also produce by carrying out the studies, quantum mechanically, theoretical studies. Here are the snapshot of two microscoping images for the case of cuprates, right? So, and that, you may be wondering what is this dg square or dx square minus y square. These are simply orbitals in which the, elect the electron has many degrees of freedom, spin, charge, orbital, lattice, and many things. So this orbital degrees of freedom of the electron, a very crucial role in defining such uh, micro, uh, superconducting states. There are many more. We can look for charge or spin ordered materials. Um, we can have new set of fundamental uh, behaviors emerging out of much insulating phenomena, strange metals, and we can examine several uh, of uh, quantum critical phases. These are just some of the results that our group uh, has obtained. And then coming out of the quantum material, now we can have look at how we look at the energy materials. If you see this schematic, this basically tells that how the future is going to be driven by batteries. There is an increased demand of long range electric vehicles. For example, new battery material discovery is just simply essential. We cannot stay away from it. Right here on the right, we have just shown a schematic illustration of how it behaves. A typical battery has a cathode, has an anode, and this has an electrolyte. If you look, if if you think of a lithium ion battery in that uh, dimension, and the lithium ion diffuses from one end of the, one cathode to the other cathode, and while the electrons move on the external circuit that completes the cell, right? So we have to find out a proper cathode, a proper anode, and a proper electrolyte. And this can be obtained uh, at the atomistic level. Chaitanya, uh, Suras, uh, and uh, Satyas, they spearhead our endeavor on energy materials. So they look for dimensional anode materials, look for lithium and batteries. They look for several of electrolytes. And not only that, they examine the solid electrolyte interface because that is where optimization of efficiencies are crucial. So the team not only examine cathodes, anodes, the team also study interface engineering as a good strategy to enhance the battery performance. Not only the simply quantum and energy material, um, all of us must be wondering that how the jet engine operates, where, how they will be very efficient. The, in recent days, there are enough research, there's a large scale research on high energy, high entropy alloys. These alloys can withstand temperature much larger than single element alloys that we have generally, we are generally acquainted or comfortable with it. Why high temperature, why do we need alloys which can withstand high temperature? Because at high temperature, the efficiency, efficiency of these engines uh, indeed increase uh, uh, substantially. Right. For example, on the right, we have a graph demonstrating that this regular single element alloys, if you take, right, so you can operate the, for the safety measure, you can operate within a limit of 1100 degrees Celsius. The efficiency by and large lies uh, less than 60 percent, uh, right? So, but if we desire to increase the efficiency further and in, so we have to go to the higher temperature scale. Suppose you want to go to an efficiency of 70 percent. And you have to operate your machine engine at 1150 degrees, right? This is not simply possible by this regular single element alloys. We have to develop 
uh, high entropy alloys. On the below, we have shown how the high entropy alloys, uh, just the last uh, bar, right, provides, operates at the temperature. This is the high entropy alloys that we have shown here can operate at 1300 degrees uh, Celsius. Whereas the rest of the single element alloys, I don't want to go to the names, but the rest of all are single element alloys, which operates at a range of 1100 to 1150. This is just one example, right? Why we need to develop uh, or carry out atomistic uh, modeling and design materials so that they can be used uh, many application in this case in uh, jet engine. Right, so what we are focusing on at the moment in high entropy alloys, we are looking for, we're looking at vast chemical and configurational space and their high temperature application. We are examining the mechanical properties, thermodynamical stability of these alloys um, using atomistic modeling. Uh, we are employing uh, machine learning approaches uh, that can accelerate, accelerate our, our predictions. Okay, so this, I gave a brief overview how we are employing the theory that has been developed at a quantum mechanical level or at a level of uh, classical phenomena like molecular dynamics or electromagnetic theory to find out the properties of material, okay? That is not sufficient, right? So we have to, if we want to jump and predict your material at a faster rate, right? We have to take the support of artificial intelligence and machine learning. To understand that aspect, here yeah, I have some, shown you one schematic slides. Right? Suppose we have a design problem. For example, we have a design problem in uh, developing efficient and self-sustainable batteries, or we have a design problem in producing uh, large uh, H2. Right? The conventional way of looking at is, is that you just carry out experiments at lab or simulations uh, in the computer room uh, by applying intuition, heat and trial approach, and from the past understanding, and then see that if that can give rise to certain uh, new, uh, new elements or new compounds or new mechanism or new set of systems that can help us in solving the design problem. What if we can bring our AI and machine learning and ignore this heat and trial approach? Right. Nowadays, we all know that AI and machine learning are far too capable and they are far too better compared to the heat and trial approach. Right. So you can directly identify the design problem, employ the AI and machine learning for material discovery, and then we can directly come with new materials. Right. This works in a uh, uh, various level of uh, schemes. Right. For example, we are in a group. We are looking at several of stuffs. We are looking at polymers. We are trying to discover polymers using machine learning. We are trying to discover new small molecules. We are trying to uh, discover uh, large degrees of oxides. I have just given a sample space for ferroelectric oxides. Right. These are crucial for polar systems. And what we do is that we take a particular feature and we, we pass it through an encoder, it goes a Latin space, it decode it, then you give the new material. So, Satya, sorry, uh, uh, our uh, colleague Rohit and Tarak can give a better understanding of how the AI and ML works. I'm just representing them in this. Roughly what you do, you identify features, characteristics, right, or descriptors. In this case, let's say, consider in a molecule, molecule, if you look at the electronic configurations, it has a highest occupied molecular orbital or it has a lowest unoccupied molecular orbital. These two play a crucial role in defining the properties of the molecule. So these two can act as a uh, feature or descriptor. So that you pass through the typical AI and ML algorithm. Each you can then develop for each molecule one unique QR code right, that for a given uh, property to predict the properties and that QR code. Now, once you map that and develop a QR code, I think you can put it in a neural network and stuff. Then you can come up with millions of molecules and predict their properties. Um, on the right, I think uh, my colleagues have put a, how you predict a 
homo lumo gap. As I said, that the homo lumo, that is energy separation between the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital and highest unoccupied molecular orbital, depend that energy separation is basically the gap. Depending on the gap value, you see several properties of the molecule changing, right? Then, uh, then accordingly, the homo lumo gap is a perfect descriptor or a feature, right? How to predict the homo lumo gap for a molecule? We have using machine learning. This is just a uh, demonstration. Not only that, if we want to develop sustainable polymers, for example, one big problem with the present day plastic uh, materials is that you, it is difficult to degrade them because of their immiscibility behavior, right? The several components in a polymer, they stay separated, they don't mix. Can we come up with a good mechanical properties in a system so that there can be, a, we can improve the miscibility, there can be dynamical cross-links, right? If the miscibility increases, the chances to degrade these materials can uh, enhance, right? So this we can achieve by employing this uh, cutting edge AI and machine learning algorithm, right? In future, we can drive this AI and ML uh, algorithm to develop a robotic platform. That robotic platform provides us a you know active learning uh, place, right? It can sort of, even though not completely, it can sort of replace the experimental uh, uh, workflow, right? Here we can develop a known database. Um, from known database, you would develop the employ this model training. Uh, that is, for example, ML model GPR. Then from the model, you predict uh, so properties for real world experiments. And then you select and carry out the next experiment. And this loop goes on and on and on till you reach the maximum efficiency. I think future is they are in developing robotic labs. I think uh, have pro probably made a best possible attempt to provide you a glimpse of what the center of excellence carrying out what kind of research we are carrying out out of the at the center, uh, center for atomistic modeling and materials design so one other aspect which is lying at the forefront in our center is to develop a material database and i invite my colleague uh, satya Syadav to give a little bit insight more insight into how we are coming up with this materials database satya Okay, thanks, Ranjit. Uh, so we started with this question that uh, uh, you have access to this uh, uh, your chat GPT, right? Most favorite uh, where you most of our students go to ask questions. Now you ask it, uh, what are the materials that are available and what is the efficiency? Uh, and this is the specific question I wanted to know: list cathode material that has gravimetric capacity of at least 100 milliamp uh, per gram after 500 cycles. And this is a reasonable question to ask and no answer on that what are the various cathode materials that are available which would sustain a, sustain a cycle of 50, 500 cycles. Yeah, well, the typical cycle is 1000, but just, just to frame a question, I said 500 cycles. Now, you see the answer that ChatGPT gives you. It uh, lists all sort of well-established uh, uh, system which contain mostly lithium. Uh, why it showed up? Although if you, and I have a publication uh, with my group members, and I see several other publications which will not be even listed over here. It is simply because this database, the way it is searching and listing, is highly biased and it's probably gives you the top uh, result, not necessarily going into unbiased, all the publication that is available. And it is not its fault. It is simply because it's just impossible to scavenge through this millions of publication on battery material and uh, be able to search this information, specifically this gravimetric capacity. Why? Because some of those publications would have reported in terms of a graph, someone would have reported in a text form, someone would have reported in a tab tabular form. It just become impossible for even these search engines to go scavenge through these publications and give you the unbiased data of what is available in literature. 
So this is what we are trying to overcome by building this materials database, uh, by, by in including all these parameters. So if you see one of the crucial parameter that is necessary for operation of battery material is what it is gravimetric capacity at a given cycle, after a given cycle. So we are going to include all these parameters. So starting with whether the ion that is uh, participating is lithium or sodium, whether it's a half cell or full cell, uh, what is the stoichiometry of the cathode material that was used, anode material. Uh, we will include what are the elements that were used. Uh, and then its performance, uh, depending upon the cycle, volumetric, uh, gravimetric, uh, capac energy capacity, or power that we can extract by knowing the current density, what was the electrolyte and separator that were used. Uh, one more crucial that uh, in general, when you see databases, some are biased towards storing only computational information, but what we would be able to achieve by this database, not only computational, but also experimental data would be available. Uh, this gives us a good way of uh, uh, just searching through all available literature where the capacity has been reported. So, and this, to tell you just one example how it could be used is right now we don't produce uh, batteries in India simply because they use expensive material which are not available in India, lithium, cobalt, nickel, they, their resources are not abundantly available. But you know for sure there are literature out there which suggests there are alternate material that could be used uh, which are abundantly available in India. It just so happens that uh, we have to work on upgrading those initial researches that are suggestive that those things can work, but technology need to be developed to make sure that they are at a large scale and we can produce commercially. Uh, so then you can go to next slide. So not only the battery materials database, we are also, once we establish that, we are also going to develop a database for superconductors, polymers, uh, catalyst, thermoelectric material, quantum material, pretty much all the materials that the group is working in general, where we will host data not only uh, available, not only done uh, data done using computational tools that we use, but also the experiment. This is where the huge opportunity is there for you to collaborate with the center. Thanks, Andy. So thanks, Satish, for this uh, beautiful insight to our database. As Satish said that we are looking for collaborations with both experimentals and theoreticians and the like, both from India and abroad, to make a successful database for everyone. Um, as I said, that we cannot work in silos. Right? We need to interact with colleagues internationally and nationally. That's why our we can build strength, we can go up in the ladder in predicting and designing materials, coming up with new fundamental quantum states and new properties. Um, here is a couple of animated points where how we are collaborating in all across the globe. So well, we have successfully developed a footprint across the globe. In the national scenario, we have built a strong collaboration unit. We can see that every nook and corner of India, any, any institute of national importance, we have a partner. Okay, so our research cannot go on without real support. So we have partners. We have partners from the public institutes, from the government of India. We have funding from SCRB, we have funding from DRDO, we have funding from ISRO, we have funding from Ministry of Education, we have funding from National Superconducting Missions. We are also equally excited to partner with industries. We are now working with, closely working with TCS, Pfizer, LAM Research Foundation. Um, but more than this, we must thank Institute of IIT, uh, IIT Madras for giving us the sizable funding to initiate this center of excellence, establish this center of excellence. We are not only carrying out research, we have a strong outreach uh, unit. Uh, for example, uh, biennially, every two years, we are carrying out an international school and conference on evolution of electronic structure theory and experimental realization, Easter. This is a biennial event. The last one happened in last uh, January. Uh, the next one is coming on 2025 January. 
and also we have planned to uh, you know start a series on machine learning workshop that will also be a binary event so alternatively e-store then machine learning then e-store and machine learning and ai will continue on top of it we are inviting several students to be part to uh, be, uh, become an intern in our research groups and learn new things okay finally i must thank all of you for your attention to know more details please visit our website uh, camd.iitm.ac.in you can click on the qr code and at the end we must thank our global engagement office for helping us in many possible ways for smooth running and establishing this center of excellence and we must deeply appreciate to our present director professor v kamakoti the former director professor baskar ramurthy and our dean global engagement professor raghunath rangaswamy to contribute to help and to find a way to establish center of excellence thank you all thank you very much all right well let's thank uh, professor uh, professors nanda and uh, uh, yadav and all the co pis for putting together a wonderful uh, presentation that gave an overview of the work that they are pursuing and plan to pursue in the future um i think there are a bunch of questions in question and answer and uh, maybe you know either professor nanda or um any of the panel members can actually take up that uh, those set of questions yeah i think how is the first question is how is superconductivity induced in real world application given the very low transition temperature santanu yeah uh, <clears throat> that's a interesting question that often comes up uh, regarding uh, the various forms of superconductivity and the history of the field and it's a very pertinent question uh, the question probably the answer to the question has a few parts to it uh in terms of let's say the superconductors that you look from the perspective of applications uh the question that you're often asking is that uh for the temperature scale or range at which a material becomes superconductor what is the cost of keeping the uh superconductor in the superconducting state so uh historically once kind of you figured out how to cool down or uh, how to have liquid nitrogen uh at a relatively cheap cost uh you had the possibility of using for example the high tc superconductors uh and you could use them for various applications uh superconductors now are extensively being used for various applications where you want to have for example high magnetic field environments for example in mri machines or in these particle accelerators that you hear about uh but other than that uh superconductors uh i i think what really kind of uh, has stuck to the imagination of the scientific community as well as the public is of course the potential of having superconductors working at higher temperatures but also the fact that in principle there is nothing hindering uh, us finding a superconductor to work at uh, close to room temperature or at room temperature uh, in terms of the principle by which superconductivity works you had in related the recent times the discovery of these what are called as hydride superconductors which put under extremely high pressures you could get a superconductivity close to room temperatures but then that might not be very uh, kind of useful for application perspective but the proof of concept was there in more recent times in the last 5 or 10 years you're uh, finding that you can actually create significant enhancement of superconductivity not just by material engineering but also by having certain kind of perturbations you have certain nickelate compounds where you finding that at ambient pressure the material is not superconducting you put not that higher pressure and suddenly it superconducts uh, superconducts at around 80 kelvin or so so it begs the question that can we create a material database systematically understand what are the primary criteria that experimentalists can look at to engineer materials to ask that you know if you can apply certain uniaxial strain certain hydrostatic pressure that is likely to enhance the superconductivity and that is i think where the game is headed to right now and uh, lastly i'll also like to mention that superconductors in in addition to having this unique property of having a zero resistance and a diamagnetic property have also a very important secondary application for example in topological materials 
uh, the superconductivity can actually be used to induce the non-trivial topology in these materials. And these non-trivial topology then goes on to the question of looking at, you know, the uh, possibility of decoherence free, uh, free uh, uh, charge transport, uh, looking at possibility of quantum information, applications to quantum information. So holistically, it is a very exciting field with a lot of possibilities. And uh, I think it is worth kind of uh, investing into it and thinking about these questions. Thanks, Anthony. Uh, for a very elaborated answer i i hope it has it must have excited many participants to know more about the superconductors the other question that has come on our way is that from the perspective of modeling batteries lithium or any other material what are the trade offs of charge density life cycle etc uh, chaitanya could you take this question yeah so Modeling wise, uh, uh, simulating the life cycles is not uh, at feasible like through the atomistic modeling, but we can understand about the specific charge densities. Like, so if you have a material that can show higher specific charge capacity, for example, that is more useful for us. Like, so you can store a lot of charge for a small amount of substance. That's what is the specific charge capacity they're uh, corresponding to. And uh, similarly, like uh, the voltage of the entire cell is more. So with specific charge capacity and the voltage, both of them together, if you have, that means you have a good energy density material. So the amount of energy the material can deliver uh, per gram will be more. So that way, specific charge capacity increment is useful. Of course, there will be materials, although they will be uh, providing a lot of, uh, having a lot of uh, specific charge capacity, but as the life cycles are increasing, the number of cycles are increasing, their uh, capacity might fade out. So, but that uh, life cycle thing, we cannot uh, study using the uh, atomistic modeling. That way, it is, we are not able to- That, that goes to, beyond the atomistic model. That goes beyond the atomistic model, yes. Yeah. Okay, so we have a question from Suvam Devora. Are exclusive igneous rocks good option to withstand the heat for temperature more than 1700 degrees Celsius and cool it? Could it be used in the system? So this, this is a question in the context of high entropy alloys. Right. So yeah, it's not just about, uh, of course, your ceramic melts at way higher temperatures, right? So it's not just about uh, uh, the temperature to which they should withstand. They have to be, uh, uh, so if, uh, what is the problem with rocks uh, and in general ceramics, right? Uh, they are brittle in nature. And even at that temperature, they remain brittle. So, yeah, but in operating condition, you cannot afford to have brittle material. Uh, they still need to have some degree of toughnesses. So this is where exactly we uh, came in. And uh, so multiple things has to be uh, go right. And that's why to date, uh, I mean, this is just for your uh, information that uh, to date, there are uh, three companies, three companies in the world, uh, which manufacture jet engines. There are a lot of players who manufacture airplanes, but jet engines are very, very tricky to manufacture simply because the kind of metal that goes into it and the way they are uh, synthesized are very tricky. In, in can, one can make jet engines, but jet engine lasting for 10 years, 20 years are very tricky to make. So uh, it's not just about sustaining high temperature, but also having tough, right toughness, uh, right type of creep behavior and various mechanical properties. Then only you would be able to achieve the, the then you would, you would be able to use them for uh, jet engines. Um, thanks, Satis. Uh, I, I would also like to mention that the number, the sort of application that we presented in these few slides, we are not limited to that. Our research is much beyond this few set of applications. Uh, in that regard, we are really looking for collaboration with uh, uh, people within India and abroad uh, to expand our act the activities of our center. So there is a question by an attendee that do participants, students have access to the file shared at the end of the webinar? I think our uh, Dean Global Engagement Office uh, will have the access to this uh, yeah, file. I think they can provide you. Uh, uh, yes, we'll be uploading the video on YouTube and we'll also be, um, I mean, if uh, you're sharing the PPT, we'll also upload it on our website. So, yeah, yeah. So, uh, 
so maharaja uh, he, he asks professor i heard recent discovery of lk99 is this superconductor i think professor subramanian sankarano is right typing an answer if i look at the icon is that Professor yeah, well, I, I, I would actually let Chantanu reply to this and then I can actually just um, type in and reply. Santanu, would you like uh, to take so, it? Um, uh, sorry, uh, Ranjit, what is specifically the question? Uh, uh, maybe I can also talk. So, this is that recent discovery of LK99. Is it, is this a superconductor? Okay, so probably the initial excitement is because of the fact that there's a sharp drop in the resistivity and it seems that the in mentors could show some sort of magnetic levitation uh, the magnetic levitation can happen due to uh, you know this uh, any diamagnetic behavior it can come it can also come from the impurity phases similarly a sharp drop in the resistivity can also happen due to many other phenomena so experimenters recently they try to reproduce these compounds and you see that whether they are these are superconductor or not this lk99 this apatite material mineral uh, they could not reproduce uh, so therefore in a sense lk99 is no longer believed to be a superconductor but there is another school of thought the school of thought is that now so far we have been examining the equilibrium states the stable properties stable, the properties are the stable equilibrium right but most of the materials so various degrees of properties are the metastable state so i think it is time to harness this metastable uh, the properties are the metastable state if one can control them so some some of the uh, experts who are working in superconductor like professor baskar on your from this campus uh, they believe that maybe that this compound has shown superconductivity, but in the metastable state, uh, uh, and which may not be easy to reproduce. But Santanun, uh, would you like to add a little more into? Yeah, I mean, uh, I would say that in uh, last few years, you have had quite a few candidates. Uh, either they are, uh, you know, single crystals or disordered systems in which there have been claims uh, of it being. Uh, possibly a room temperature superconductor. And the evidence is often associated with uh, extremely uh, significant drop in resistivity uh, below a certain temperature and presence of a diamagnetic effect. Uh, now, both of these are features of superconductors, but both of these features don't necessarily make a material a superconductor. Uh, but you can always ask the question that if we, are, we need a, a, a very low resistivity, for getting you know, a transport without too much loss in energy. And if we have a strong diamagnetic effect, uh, then why do we need the word superconductivity? See, uh, the superconductivity is associated with a long range coherence uh, of the wave functions that uh, lead uh, to the transport in such systems. So the superconducting state is also associated with high critical currents. So in terms of applications, this long range coherence is crucial. So it is not just a story of having a very low resistance and a strong diamagnetic effect, but also getting the long range coherence in what is called as a macroscopic wave function. And that is where kind of the applications, it protects uh, the system, if I might use the word, uh, from essentially losing its uh, low resistive state or losing its diamagnetic state uh, up to a certain critical point. So. Uh, so that is where kind of the question lies that in, it seems that in many of these systems, they might not truly be superconducting. Uh, so the question is that can we truly find what we can call as a superconductor getting a macroscopic wave function to be uh, defined or uh, existing in those systems? So we have Professor Subramanian, he has written an answer, uh, which I'm excited to read out. So unfortunately, it doesn't seem to seem so based on reports emerging so far. You can read up an interesting blog on how machine learning can help identify the next superconductor. It has given a link. Uh, all of you can uh, go through this link. Uh, maybe Professor yeah. Subram can add a little bit into it. Yeah, no, those were early days when there was still excitement about LK99. And, um, uh, you know, the, the, the team has several experts on AIML, um, and maybe they can chime in. Um, but there is a role for AIML not only to identify 
materials that are likely to have uh, superconducting behavior in terms of features based on whatever we know so far, um, but also to actually enable discovery of new type of superconductors which have not been explored so far. And that includes materials out of equilibrium, like was actually said uh, before, uh, the metastable materials. Um, uh, so, so there is this blog that I was actually reading at that time, which kind of used several of these um, basic ML techniques to actually identify whether what is so unique about LK99 compared to um, other superconductors. And at that time, there was nothing that seemed very different. Uh, and, and, and so it was even more puzzling. But later on, of course, all of this got resolved. Um, as as you and Shantanu have pointed out, so actually, I mean, so the excitement come from theory perspective because some people claim that there are flat bands at the Fermi. So we have put on an article in the archive saying that there are no flat bands. So people may have a look at it. Um, the flat bands are, you know, some crucial bands for uh, originating superconductivity. Okay, so we have a question. Uh, in case investors are looking to validate startup technology, is there any avenue to partner with the center or folks working in the center? Yes, we are more than willing to be a partner in your endeavor. Please contact us, uh, visit our website. By the way, I must say that this, this is the basic version of the website which we released today. Slowly it will be, we will keep on updating and new features will be added. We'll add how to collaborate with us, how, what are the news and events or what are the things happening, what are the exciting stuff that are coming out of the center. You will uh, you'll get all the updates from our center and we'll, we'll have a special window uh, to look for collaboration with investors. Um, there is by question by Lalita Guteti, what is gravimetry capacity uh, defined after a given cycle? Maybe Suraj or Chaitanya can take it. I believe this is more related to Satyesh Bhaiya's question. Satyesh. Uh, yeah, but the gravimetric capacity. Okay. Satyesh Bhaiya, please go ahead. Okay. So gravimetric capacity is to do with the capacity uh, per gram, right? So this gives a sense that uh, you might actually achieve the same capacity in a very, uh, for a very large weight. Uh, but you have to use the battery. The sense, you see that Whenever you use the battery, it goes along with the vehicle, especially for mobility application, or you are holding that battery in your hand when you are using in your phone. So even if there is a huge capacity that you could obtain, for a large weight, you don't want that. So always the capacity are defined mostly in terms of per, uh, per gram, so that you can compare across the material system that for uh, uh, the same weight, how much uh, charge it can hold. Uh, so that gives a good way to compare across various uh, system and you can choose and you can compare that, okay, this uh, material has the same performance or similar performance or poor performance compared to other. In that sense, lithium does seems to have uh, out uh, outwitted uh, most of the material, but a lot of, at least uh, some of the researchers that are going on recently, sodium, which is uh, widely available, are also coming close to existing lithium ion uh, systems. I think now people are looking for alternate batteries, sodium, aluminum, magnesium, calcium. So there's a question, how close we are in breakthrough in quantum computing, room temperature. I think the, Ankit wants to say superconductor. Uh, I think we don't have the expertise to talk on quantum computing. I think people are working on uh, developing uh, materials so that they can produce qubits which can have a long range correlation. That's what roughly I believe. but. Uh, room temperature superconductor, uh, Anthony. So yeah, I mean, uh, I, I, like I said before, uh, you are, I mean, if you look at essentially uh, the highest TCs or transition temperatures that you have in Q-trades, uh, that already is significantly high. Um, in terms of the cost of kind of maintaining those uh, superconductors in the superconducting state, the price is uh, less than the cost of a liter of milk. Uh, so you can actually use these superconductors for application and they are being used. 
Now, as much as room temperature superconductors go, uh, you can actually enhance. Uh, you do have certain kind of uh, materials which are hydride based, uh, where you have seen evidence of almost room temperature superconductivity almost. Uh, if you apply a very large hydrostatic pressure, by large, I mean of uh, probably an astronomical scale. And then you're able to get uh, TCs which are at the room temperatures. So the question is that the proof of concept exists that it can happen in certain material systems. Whether it can happen in uh, ambient pressure, we don't know yet. But you have very recently uh, certain classes of materials that are coming up where you are seeing that at lower pressure, these are solid materials, uh, single crystals, in which uh, in the presence of uh, hydrostatic pressure, you are seeing a significant enhancement in TC. Uh, the question whether, where, when will they, or where, how will they lead to a room temperature superconductor or when? Uh, that is a question maybe uh, our center in the long run can uh, yeah. contribute towards uh, some development in that area. We are very hopeful in that direction. Yeah. So there is a question by Avijit, uh, nice presentation. One slide mentioned about perovskite topology. How do you address anharmonicity in perovskite? Okay, I think that's a work that which I carry out. So these perovskites uh, under equilibrium state, they don't show any topological state. If you apply pressure or strain, you can make a normal insulating state to a topological insulating state. The anharmonicity uh, doesn't have that much of a role. Uh, in the perovskite uh, topological quantum of state. In fact, uh, so we are, we are the very few groups who are predicting topological states in perovskites. And recently, there is a experimental proof that has come up from the Indian Institute of Cultivation of Science, ISCS, where they showed that like if you apply pressure, you can, uh, you can always produce a topological state, validating what uh, our theory has predicted. So in a sense, it also shows that how we can actually contribute uh, in a real sense to the different defining or designing or predicting the properties. I think we have enough questions on superconductor LK99. Maybe move on to second question, next question. Uh, Saroj Patra, so he is completely new to computational material science, worked on group three, four semiconductor, group three, five semiconductor for quantum well. Uh, laser application, we wish to start work on the exciting field. Could you help us in, in this regard? Please contact us. Uh, go to our website, find the contact. Please contact us. We're also happy to talk to you and see in which way we can help you. We can be a part to your research. For Deepak Goyal, again, uh, do different superconducting materials have different properties? Uh, Shantanu? Uh, yeah, I'm not sure exactly what the question is asking. Um, yes, so, okay, that superconductive properties will be one thing, but other properties as you vary the temperature or other stuff will vary. There is no, like, superconducting materials are superconductor. Other properties under different pressure and temperature condition can vary. I think that's well, the best answer can we give, Santam? Yeah, I mean, uh, the only thing I like to add is that many of these superconductors, uh, which fall under the category of what are called as unconventional superconductors, often tend to be what are called as strongly correlated materials. And in these materials, the presence of electron correlations, that means, you know, very loosely speaking, the Coulomb interaction between the electrons uh, makes the possible phases in these materials very diverse. So you would see a find that often a phase diagrams exist for these materials where there could be an axis of uh, pressure of you know uh, chemical doping or others. And uh, as you tune the material properties for different pressures, different chemical dopings or other parameters, you find that all host of new phases come up. Some or some which are superconducting, some show unusual charge order or spin ordered phases, some show uh, some kind of a sudden transition to an insulating phase. Uh, so the presence of correlation makes uh, these materials very rich in terms of the properties they can have. So maybe if that... Yeah, works. okay. So next question, quantum dot also comes in atomistic modeling. Yes, quantum dots can come in atomistic modeling. And some of us who are, uh, may not be very extensively, but yes, we have the know-how to pursue atomistic modeling for quantum dots. 
Hello, sir. My question is, do quantum materials exhibit quantum behavior? I mean, the name quantum materials stands for the point of view is that they have quantum behavior. If so, how is machine learning analyzing their probabilistic uh, nature? Um, I will request Rohit to answer. Rohit, I think the gentleman here is pulling out the uncertainty that we see in quantum mechanics and is expecting how whether machine learning can help us. Yeah, so I think the two are not that correlated. Mm -hmm. uh, so the probabilistic thing in quantum mechanics uh, is completely different than the probabilistic thing we talk about in the data uh, or in machine learning. So the probabilistic theory in data is more about that given, say, a material which is a which is exhibiting some quantum uh, properties, uh, whether there is some uncertainty around that. Um, so uh, very simply, in the data itself, if you have some uncertainty, that is what we try to use in uh, machine learning. Uh, and so if you have a database or you have a large amount of data of quantum materials, then you can use that data along with machine learning to build some uh, model on top of it. Um, so yeah, the two are uncorrelated, but still you can use machine learning for discovery of quantum materials. So next question comes from uh, Dr. Mudit Dixit. He's a scientist across the road, I believe, from CLRI. So Mudit has this question, there are multiple pre-existing databases, such, such as materials project, A-flow, etc. How is the present database expected to stand out? Satyas, could you give a brief on it? Right. Uh, so yeah, uh, we, we, we did part of the question before. Uh, so one clear cut uh, distinction that we are establishing is if you go to materials project, A-flow, they all host data which are uh, generated by computing using mostly density functionality or maybe some other computing tool. What we are going to host is uh, to start with batteries. It would be not only computer data, but also uh, experimental data, which was which is what made it really hard for us to come up with in a, in a uniform uh, way to store it. But now we, have, we are confident that uh, we would be able to store data not only coming from experiment, uh, but we would be also able to host a similar data which is being hosted on materials. Okay. So, okay. Uh, the next question, transition metals are at the forefront of research into strongly correlated materials and catalysis. How far have we come in understanding the fundamentals of narrow D-bands and their importance in modeling materials? How far have we moved from conventional DFT to understanding new materials? Um, I must say that I think now we have a fairly good understanding on the narrow D-band behavior. I, the, the, the theories for strongly correlated systems is pretty matured. Uh, we can predict the strongly correlated phenomena and their application, both in, let's say, magnetism or catalysis. Uh, I think DFT has a large degree of contribution in it. Plus, there are many model theories like uh, Hubbard uh, model and many others, uh, which one can employ to understand these uh, new materials and the D-band materials or the transfer metal systems. So there is a question. Uh, if the panel experts were to prognosticate which materials and application would be next out of the lab to have a tangible, measurable impact in consumer products? Ah, I will request Rohit or Tarak to give a view on this. This is interesting because they are the guys who are looking at the large database, large world in materials informatics and can give an opinion. Yeah, so these questions are very uh, difficult to answer. See, if we know that material, uh, then uh, we can easily be millionaires, right? That's not the case. So, yeah, but uh, at, what we can say is uh, it, it does not mention the application, right? What particular application? Yeah, it doesn't mention, uh, mention that. So maybe uh, on the battery side, maybe we can say that 
solid polymer electrolytes there's a lot of research going on in that area so few companies are also startup companies are also coming up in that area so they do solve uh, this uh, problem of safety with the batteries a uh, lot of processing issues also are solved with that so some material in that domain i think uh, will be uh, what you can see uh, can create huge uh, uh, change similarly in the hydrogen production side uh, there is a issue with electrolytes there also a lot of research is going on in that area also so i would say hydrogen production which is for uh, replacing carbon uh, for any energy source so that's one thing and then for your battery vehicles you have uh, electrolytes which are more safer i think uh, in addition to this hard matters there are a lot of applications that are coming out of soft matters like polymers small molecules maybe tarak can add into it the sustainable material drug delivery drug discovery yeah these are the domain to see tarak can you add something yeah i think i think you know many application the limitations is the large amount of data is not available i mean only large amount of data you can think of is the protein data bank uh, that's where some structured way they have put together a large amount of data but if i want to look at other applications like this polymer recycling what uh, could be a potential cross linker or or i'm looking for glass transition temperature there is not much in terms of huge databases are available even they are there they are sparse and as uh, Satyas was uh, emphasizing that it's very difficult to mine from large amount of published literature. Mm. That's a one bottleneck. I mean, we have been developing uh, machine learning methods uh, which can learn properties using smaller amount of data. And there are, uh, you know, in general, open-ended questions like how much data you need to build a very efficient machine learning model and which are those data. And I think overall the field needs to evolve in many of those applications. Uh, of course, uh, development of more efficient algorithm at the same time, availability and more structured data are required uh, to really go forward. I think uh, interestingly, Suraj is also working uh, uh, something on that direction. Suraj, would you like to add, like you're working with industry? Yes, I mean. Uh... One, one thing I like to add, just to add with what Rohit told. So, I mean, we are also, this hydrogen production is an area where people are most looking at. And also as a storage, as ammonia as a storage. So the material development in that direction is something that's widely going on. And uh, related to industry, it's uh, something like automate, I mean, identifying and their reactants, which should be the right molecule to start with. That's something they are looking at. For example, in some molecule, they need a particular kind of a pH or pK value. And uh, that pK value, they can, how you can identify without doing any experiment just from computations. The automating such things are something going on. I mean, that we are also working. So then there is a question, can we see liquid superconductor, gas superconductor? No, I yeah, guess. So, no, no, so... Uh... Yeah, I like to say that, uh, so effectively, uh, generically speaking, superconductivity is a phenomenon of interaction. So you have an effective interaction, which causes the formation of what you call as Cooper pairs, creating the superconducting state. Now, gases being very low density, right? Uh, per se, by definition, are uh, extremely weakly interacting. So you don't have, uh, cannot or unlikely to have a phenomenon of superconductivity in gases. The hydrides that we talk about are again in high pressure. You are creating uh, an effective solid at those pressures. For liquids, you don't have the phenomenon of superconductivity, but of course you have the famous example of superfluid helium-3, which is, uh, you can say an equivalent of a superconductor without charge in it. Uh, so yes, so in that sense, uh, there is a equivalence in liquids, but yeah, not in gases, unlike okay. liquid in gases. Thanks, so if I co-polymerize an N-type polymer with a P-type polymer, is there a possibility of obtaining an ambipolar material? How can we identify this through DFT studies? Uh, Tarak, uh, would you like to take this question? No, I think I'll give it to Rahid. 
So he is very close to those calculations. Rohit? Yeah, I'm looking for the question. So the question is, if I copolymerize an n-type polymer with a p-type polymer, is there a possibility of obtaining a MB polar material? How can we identify this through the... Yeah, so DFT studies with the... Uh, yeah, so uh, the short answer is yes, uh, you can get it. But doing DFT studies on polymers is highly tricky. Uh, so, and the simple reason is DFT is limited to a few hundreds of atoms. And when we are talking of uh, polymers, uh, generally we are talking of, uh, of the order of 10,000 or millions of atoms. So how, how to do DFT uh, or approximate DFT calculations, which uh, is applicable to polymers. So that is very difficult. Uh, oh. There are few ways, few tricks we use to do it. These are still approximations. Uh, with this, you can get some idea, but definitely uh, we are not uh, simulating a realistic scenario. Okay, so the next question is... So, Sajid, uh, I think Chaitanya has... Chaitanya can add something. Hey, I just wanted to say that if, if it is majorly about the charges that Swati is concerned about, there is an option called constrained DFT. There is a particular method called constrained DFT where you can constrain the negative charge as well as the positive charge to a specific portion of the polymer so that you can uh, easily uh, study such kind of things using the density functional theory as well. if that was the concern. That is not very clear from the question. So that's why I took it. Yeah, also in our center, we are trying to build uh you know, classical force field uh, based on this DFT interaction so that we can go to higher length scale and time scale phenomena. So we made some progress, particularly in polymer systems. So we will be able to address these questions in future. Thanks, uh, Tarak and Chaitanya. Uh, there is a question again, I think, for Chaitanya and Suraj. What is current scenario of solid electrolyte in commercial battery application? Solid electro, it's not solid electrolyte interface. Yeah. Electrolytes are more towards Rohit. Yeah, you can tell us what if you have. Yeah, I'll electrolyte. just try to answer. I mean, so the solid electrolyte they are using to improve the safety of the battery because uh, the problem with the liquid electrolytes, which are immediately going to react, especially if you use anode like uh, metal anode sand. Now, here, uh, the typical problem is conductivity because the material is again, it's a you need a diffusion through the solid. So now people are trying to improve the conductivity. If you want to make it practical, we should at least uh, raise it by of, of order of uh, maybe a uh, tenth of or two. That's the current scenario. And uh, we people are trying to use different kind of polymer and certain additives or composites to enhance it. But still it's an area of, uh, which is progressing. Okay. Can superconductors lead its way to make superfast trends by magnetic levitation? Santanu. So, yeah. So, uh, right now, I would say that, uh, I mean, of course, magnetic levitation does occur, but uh, its possibility of using it in transport is, at this point, a proof of concept. Uh, to have superconductors for such applications, you have to demonstrate uh, a lot of additional features in the superconducting materials. Their, you know, uh, their life cycle, uh, how stable they are, uh, what are the critical currents they can handle. Uh, because you would have people sitting inside and in, uh, on those trains. So uh, it is not a question probably for uh, having room temperature superconductors, and that day we'll have superconductors which allow for uh, uh, super fast trains via magnetic levitation, but. Uh, kind of ticking quite a few boxes in terms of the development of materials and its properties or development of such superconductors. So I think uh, that is not where we are uh, in superconductivity research right now. It is still kind of at a very uh, uh, scientific level where we are asking the question of how to engineer or develop superconductors with more ideal properties. And the hope is that those properties would lead in the future to such possibilities. 
Okay, so there is a question, general question. Can new people join ongoing researches? If yes, what are the minimum requirements? Yes, people can join ongoing researches. As far as our center is concerned, we'd like to be associated with uh, people at various level. Uh, uh, if you are already a researcher, uh, we'd like to collaborate with you. If you want to work uh, with us as a research scholar, uh, there are certain rules that uh, some exams, qualification criteria, please go through them and uh, then join us. Uh, right. Then if you are looking for a postdoctoral positions, uh, we'll be happy to consider your applications. We can have a discussion. And there are many other avenues. We are looking for student interns. Um, you know, uh, we are looking for uh, people to give ideas and solutions uh, in general. So yes, uh, we will be more excited to be associated. Um, so minimum requirements are depending on um, the stage at which you want to work. So we have staff positions also, like staff positions, as well. positions, depending on their uh, uh, their academic qualifications and experience. Those are also reasonably long period appointment. So please write to us, and we should be able to figure it out. How to become a researcher is a very philosophical question. Um, I don't know. I mean, how to answer, but I believe that. The research can be done in any domain, any subject, science, non-science, uh, any area. But if you want to do research, first update yourself with an existing literature in that particular area, then start developing questions, ideas, and then try to solve them. This is the basic module of being a researcher. Uh, but it's very much a philosophical question. It applies to every domain. But any member or the you know, chairman, if they want to add something, please. I'll just say that uh, if you have any curiosity, just start acting on it. Exactly. Can you please uh, give insight, uh, insight a bit about berry curvature and significance? Um, it's an interesting question. I like Santana to give a brief on it. Uh, uh, I mean, it's kind of something technical. I don't know. We want to get into yeah, that <laughs> talking about thing. berry curvature right now, right? So, yes, so okay, so gentlemen, the very curvature related to the electron eigenstates um, and in a momentum space that you solve using the atomistic models, like many models, quantum mechanical models. And they are associated in many uh, ways to the topological properties of system. This is the best qualitative explanation can be given. Uh, but to know what is very curvature and things like that, it's a very technical question. Uh, probably you can write to us if you have any specific uh, desire to know any specific thing about very curvature. You can but, write. Yeah, I mean, one thing could be that a uh, good way to learn, start learning about it is to kind of pick up any good quantum mechanics book. And uh, you want to look at essentially... Uh, the more advanced chapters there, the work through yes. the most advanced chapter there, to look at you know effects of magnetic field yeah. uh, and so on, and you'll uh, you'll get into things like Aronov-Bohm effect, very curvature, and that would be a good start to so get to any topological problem. If you have uh, you know very basic understanding on quantum mechanics or you're working in that direction, uh, probably you can also drop us an email, Santanu or me. Uh, but you have, if you have not started quantum mechanics, well, it is even difficult for us to explain, isn't it, Santanu? Uh, yeah, I mean, but uh, yeah, I, I I suspect that uh, the person who's asking uh, uh, has some idea, but probably kind of the purpose of the question is to understand uh, what is the quantity that the Berry curvature is uh, connecting to. So topology would be an interesting connection, but yeah, maybe a one-on-one -on -one interaction via email would uh, be more appropriate. Yeah, you can drop an email to Santanu. Uh, Javed Akhtar, how can advancements in atomistic modeling and materials design contribute to the development of more sustainable and efficient method for recycling 
specific types of plastics, particularly those considered challenging and are non-recyclable with current technology. I think I would request uh, my colleague Tarak to take up this question. Yeah, um, you know, the current experiments or um, the processing, what uh, we do, the I think the grand challenge is that uh, miscibility, which uh, the slides um, or uh, Ranjit has shown that a lot of those polymer chemistry is that they don't mix so well. So after their life cycle is over, um, and if you want to reprocess them, first things we do, we just melt them. And then if the two liquids are not mixing, and and then if you make a, another material out of it, their mechanical properties would be low. So uh, I think that way forward is this cross-linker molecule. And now if you want to design a cross-link molecule, it's a huge chemical space. You can imagine you can take carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen. These four or five atoms, you can make millions of molecules. And which molecule should be the best cross-linker or what could be the uh, molecule best suitable for a given set of plastic is a question which can be addressed in computationally and atomistic simulations and machine learning together because you cannot screen millions of molecules in, in experiments. So, uh, so I think that the huge scopes of atomistic simulations combined with machine learning in designing cross-linker molecule. Uh, so the this particular work, we have come up with few cross-linker molecule, which seems to work for few specific types of, uh, of polymer blends. But if you really want something which can work for any class of polymer or any combinations of polymer, it, it becomes again a design question. Uh, which is uh, which has this vast chemical and 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 conformational space. So we have been developing methods to uh, which could be adopted to screen the small molecule space, uh, and particularly the small molecule has to be reactive to those polymers. So all those different facets, you know, in terms of fundamental understanding, and then coming up with the right chemistry, right um, uh, molecule is uh, is is something which. Um, where I think computational and atomistic modeling can contribute significantly to the development of more uh, recyclable plastic. I think Subham has a lot of questions on superconductors. Subham, so he now asks a new question. Can we see new superconductor from lab-made elements? I think that's the purpose. Santanu, could you add into it? So can we see new superconductors from, sorry, Ranjit? Lab synthesized compounds. I mean, it's not naturally available, but you synthesize them in the lab. Yeah, okay. I mean, a lot of the uh, new superconductors that you are seeing, uh, I mean, almost all the ITCs, uh, some of the transition metal compounds in which you're seeing superconductivity are synthesized in the lab. So the... Earlier superconductors were the elemental superconductors, aluminum, mercury, and so on. But many, most of the recent superconducting compounds are synthesized in labs. Can superconductor solenoids replace chemical propulsion in near future for space exploration? I don't know. Mm -hmm. I, I don't yeah, know. I think I think we cannot answer this. Um, Jatin uh, is asking that whether database is designed completely based on the experimental results and it, would it provide the information for systems of low dimensional such as 2D, 1D. Jatin, so our database is, we are expecting our database is not restricted to one particular domain. So it is, uh, it, first of all, it has to be both theoretical and experimental. Uh, and we have already uh, listed the areas in which we are going to develop the database. And yes, uh, this uh, low dimensional system will be part of it as a part of quantum material database. Uh, I am in my first year of computer engineering apart from pursuing BS uh, degree at IIT Madras. Could you suggest some opportunity for me as well as some path for learning? Rohit, uh, would you like to take this question? Yeah, so I think uh, people pursuing BS degree uh, have a possibility to do in um, like some projects like an intern or some project staff under our faculty. So I recommend you reaching out to the coordinator of the BS program and you can ask them that how you can uh, 
uh, reach out to different faculties to do a project with us. Um, yeah, so uh, we are uh, starting to take interns uh, who are doing BS degree, like as project stuff. So that would be a good avenue for you to look into. Okay. And, and IIT Madras now has the option of uh, replacing course by by research project. Uh, so you can explore those options as well. Okay. So there is a question uh, that do CAMMD, that is our center, work on developing or simulating or modeling on hydrometallurgical process for extraction of rare earth elements from mineral industry waste. As of as far as I am concerned, I think we are not, but my colleague from metallurgy, Satyas Yadav, can give a little more insight. I think we are not, but Satyas, could you add into it? All right, uh, we are not, uh, but definitely because uh, hydrometallurgy route also at the end of the day relies on thermodynamics. Uh, uh, so, uh, if there are specific uh, problems which uh, could be addressed uh, at a level that we deal with, so remember one thing: it's it's always uh, the way we project. Uh, I, I teach these courses, so. The way we project and uh, at, and that is true that in principle we can solve any problem and any anything and everything but remember that uh, we could barely solve those problems which could be modeled as few hundreds of atom using let's say dft maybe even few uh, tens of atom if you are using even higher level of theory or maybe few millions of atom if you are if you have a potential so uh, just see that your problem, can it fit in this domain? And uh, then we would be able to help you out. Uh, as of now, we are not directly addressing that, uh, but this is just out for those who see as a tool of anything and everything. Uh, these are the set of criteria that you need to evaluate before you try to bring the problem to atomistic uh, model. Okay. I think another question for you as well. What are the main parameters considered in database design? Ah, so database design, as in one thing we have to make sure is it is uniform, right? So for example, battery, we are still struggling to, uh, so in terms of reporting, you say that here is my capacity. Uh, uh, now capacity is reported uh, uh, that has dependence on number of cycle, which a lot of people report, not a problem. Uh, people sometimes do not even uh, say that and that has dependence on the rate at which the battery is being charged. So there are a couple of ways to report that. There are There is something called C, uh, C rate. Uh, so a lot of people will report C. And then there is, uh, but more uniform is your current density. Now, uh, 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 there is a challenge to, in fact, extract out of publication uh, current density for all the reports. Even if we try to read through graph or other things, this information would not be available. Uh, so major challenge in developing databases, especially with experiment, is to do with the fact that come up with a very uniform criteria. Uh, and that's what we are trying to solve. And at least partly we have been able to come up with a uniform criteria. But going forward, we will try to see how many things we can accommodate, which are common across the, uh, 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 the database for that particular specific application. Thanks. Uh, the next question again by Shubham. How superconductor work in Neuralink chips? I think we, none of us know about it. It's a question to Elon Musk, uh, Shubham. Okay, so there is a question, uh, please uh, request, please share the website. Yes, uh, this website already Chaitanya has uh, typed it out. CAMMD.iitm.ac.in plus, please note that this is the preliminary version of the website we are just releasing today. Um, you know, we will continuously work on it, improve it, and update new things, add new features into it. Please, uh, at uh, time to time, please visit this website. And also, we'll be happy to get your feedback if you want new information, if you think that in some way this website can help you to get more information, something new can be added. We'll be happy to incorporate that. I think uh, that was the last, no, no, so, okay. Uh, there's a question, are joining certificates important? I think it's our G office can tell about it. I think there are a couple of questions in that direction. 
uh, so they're looking for some certificate as a participant. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, so with regard to certificates, uh, I have posted the links for all our social media handles in the public chat box. So please keep following our web page. At the end of the web series, we'll update you on how to receive your certificates and other details. We'll also update the recorded sessions and other uh, materials that uh, we may have, resource materials. So please keep following our social media. Thank you. I think with this, we uh, ended the question and answer session. Um, uh, guys, uh, do you have to add anything more? Otherwise, you know, we can stop here. Yeah, just the participants who are here, that's fine. I think uh, Ms. Elil is going to say something. Yeah, so the website is not www.camd, it's just camd.iatm.ac.in. www yeah. will not work. So I okay. put it in the chat. Okay, okay, sorry. So it's a camd.iatm.ac.in. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Chaitanya, you were saying something. No, no, nothing. Uh, just thanking all the participants who are still with us, like after one and a half hours. That's fine. So we thank all of you for patiently listening to us and asking curious questions. We are thriving for collaboration. We are looking for your participation with our center. Uh, thank you all. And our special thank to our chairman, uh, Professor Subramanian. Uh, Professor Subramanian, would you like to say something? Uh, he had to leave. He, he yeah. Left. Yeah. Okay, he left already? Yeah. yeah, five minutes ago, just after 8.30, he left here. Yeah. Okay. Okay, then, so thank you all for participating. So we'd like to stop here. And uh, yeah, that's all. Uh, so thank you, everyone. Uh, and everyone that's still here, uh, next week we have two upcoming webinars. Uh, one on molecular materials and one on geophysical flows. So please do stay tuned. Thank you, Professor Anjit and the entire uh, uh, CAMD team. Thank you so much. That was such a nice session. Uh, so see you all. Uh, good night. I think there are still some okay. questions coming up. Okay. Uh, yes, so somebody asked. Just uh, encourage the people to just email us, whatever are the questions. Please email us. Uh, always available. Please visit our website. We'll give you the contact and the details. So to reach out to us, how to reach out. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Hi.